In the cryptocurrency space, we hear about all of these fancy innovations being built on top of Ethereum, and Bitcoin sort of takes a back seat from an innovation perspective. However, in late 2021, when Bitcoin upgraded to Taproot, it very quietly got the ability to run more complicated smart contracts using a feature called Schnorr signatures and discrete log contracts. So if you guys watch the end of the video, I'll be explaining what smart contracts are, how discrete log contracts work in Bitcoin. I'll talk through some use cases of discrete log contracts, and then I'll cover the biggest issues with smart contracts contracts in general. So go down below and smash the like button for smart contracts and let's level up your brains. So first, what is a smart contract? If some condition happens, you send some amount of Bitcoin to me. And if that condition doesn't happen, then I'll send some Bitcoin to you. So maybe if it's going to rain tomorrow, I'll send you a Bitcoin. But if it's going to be sunny tomorrow, you should send me a Bitcoin. And when you hear this for the first time, you might be thinking, bruh, more gambling in Bitcoin. Are you kidding me? Stop talking about this, Rep. Yes definitely gambling. But the applications of smart contracts go a lot further than just gambling, as we'll talk about later on in the video. But for a quick example, let's say you're a farmer and you need it to rain at least once a month for you to get the optimal harvest for your crops. You could hedge your crop yields by purchasing something that is effectively weather insurance. Or let's say you wanna get married at an outdoor venue, but you don't want it to rain on your wedding day. You could create a smart contract that says, hey, I paid $30,000 for this wedding. I'm willing to pay you, the insurance company, another $5,000 if it doesn't rain on my wedding day. But if it does rain on my wedding day, I want you to pay me $30,000 back. And then the insurance company would have to do some math and properly underwrite your risk so that they were making a profit in the long run across many situations that were just like yours. So if it rains and your wedding is totally ruined, maybe everyone is super mad, but at least you got your money back. And if it doesn't rain and you end up having to pay another $5,000, you'll probably be happy that you just got to have a nice day anyway. Now that we understand smart contracts and some very basic use cases of smart contracts, next let's talk about discrete log contracts and how they're implemented on the Bitcoin blockchain. All the Bitcoin blockchain does is record Bitcoin transactions. So how are we going to build smart contracting features on top of the Bitcoin blockchain? We need to use multi-sig transactions and Schnorr signatures, which were introduced in the Taproot upgrade back in late 2021. Basically a two of three multi-sig gets created for every contract. Two of the participants in the multi-sig are the two people making the bet. And then the third participant is the Oracle, which is just a fancy word for the person providing the data that we're talking about. Because discrete log contracts utilize multi-sig, they can exist natively on the base layer of Bitcoin blockchain. And no one can tell from the outside looking at the Bitcoin blockchain that this multi-sig transaction is part of a smart contract. Because from the outside, it looks just like any other regular multi-sig payment would. So in the case of the raining on your wedding example that I talked about earlier, I would have a key. The company that was trying to insure me against this rain would also have a key. And then the third key would be held by the Oracle, in this case, something like weather.com or some sort of data provider that we trusted that could tell us whether or not it did actually rain during the wedding. Then the two people that are making the bet, in this case, me and this weather insurance company, put up the Bitcoin that we are wagering on the bet. So let's say I put up $5,000 of Bitcoin and the wedding company puts up $30,000 of Bitcoin. After we lock our Bitcoin in this multi-sig, three different transactions get created. The first transaction represents the case where I win the bet. The second transaction represents the case where the insurance company wins the bet. And then and the third transaction represents the case where no one wins and we each just get refunded the money that we put into the multi-sig. Once the contract expires, the Oracle will read which event actually happened and it will use its key to sign the corresponding one of those three transactions. Once the Oracle signs the transaction that actually happened, the participants in the bet will then get to sweep the funds from the transaction that actually occurred. So if it rained and I was betting on it raining, I would collect the $30,000 plus the $5,000 that I had put up as a wager. If it was sunny, the Oracle would end up signing the transaction that corresponded to the insurance company winning the bet. And then the insurance company would sweep the funds, the $30,000 that they had put up as collateral and my $5,000 that I was paying them if they won the bet. And that transaction is just a regular on-chain multi-sig transaction. So it would look exactly the same as my CASA multi-sig or my Unchained Capital multi-sig interacting with the Bitcoin blockchain. And there's no specific data related to what our contract was sitting on the blockchain. So hopefully now we have a decent understanding of what discrete log contracts are and how they work. Next, let's go ahead and talk about some of the different use cases of discrete log contracts. The weather use case that we talked about earlier is really just one very basic example of what discrete log contracts can be used to do. But at the end of the day, a discrete log contract is basically just a bet. One of the most common bets that are placed within legacy financial markets are futures contracts. For example, maybe I want you to deliver $10,000 of Bitcoin to me 
one year from today, regardless of what the Bitcoin exchange rate is. This bet will end up being different than it would have been in traditional markets because DLCs have to be fully collateralized as we saw earlier. So first the participants would agree to the terms of the bet. And as part of that, they would each talk about how much money they're going to put up in the contract, which will represent the maximum amount of money that they could lose when the contract is executed. Let's say in this case, the person that's going to pay me $10,000 a year from now, the most they're willing to lose is two Bitcoin. So one participant puts up nothing or some very small amount, and the other one puts up two Bitcoins, which today would be worth about $40,000. If over the next year, the price stays exactly the same and the contract expires with Bitcoin being worth $20,000 again, the paying participant would settle to me half a Bitcoin or $10,000. If over the next year, the price moons and goes to 100,000, the paying participant would only have to give me 0.1 Bitcoin, right? Because 0.1 times 100,000 would give me the $10,000 of USD value that he owes me. But if over the next year, let's say the price actually crashes down from 10,000 to $1,000 per Bitcoin, the paying participant only has two Bitcoins up for collateral in the contract. And so instead of having to pay me 10 Bitcoins, which would be 10 times 1,000, $10,000, they get away with only having to pay me two Bitcoins because that's all they put in as collateral. That's what makes this option kind of dangerous for someone that wants the $10,000 a year from now, because if the exchange value of Bitcoin ever fell below, in this case, $5,000, they would be getting less than the $10,000 that they wanted to a year from now because their counterparty only put two Bitcoins into their multi-sig transaction on the discrete log contract. And so this element of the discrete log contract having to be fully collateralized is going to play a part in the negotiation of if I'm the person that wants $10,000, I'm gonna say, all right, I don't think Bitcoin is gonna go below $5,000, so it's okay if the counterparty only puts up two Bitcoin. But let's say I do think that there's a fair chance that Bitcoin would go below $5,000. I might want my counterparty to put up more collateral. Let's say instead of two Bitcoins, he now puts up four Bitcoins. That means that unless Bitcoin now falls below $2,500, which is a lot less likely than it falling down to $5,000. That's the new minimum threshold where I still get paid out all my $10,000. And you could go back and forth and negotiate whatever these prices are with your counterparty, but the counterparty is not going to want to put up more collateral unless you're compensating him in some equal and opposite way for the amount of risk that he's taking. And the Oracle for something like this could just be the Bitcoin price on the Clark Moody dashboard or a weighted average of the Bitcoin exchange rate over the 10 largest exchanges or something like that. We just talked about sort of a currency futures example, but you can do the exact same thing with stock futures. If you live outside the United States and you want access to like Apple stock futures or something like that, you could make an off-chain bet with another peer, lock up your funds in a discrete log contract and choose an Oracle, like maybe the Apple stock price on Bloomberg.com, for example. The Oracle, Bloomberg in this case, has no idea who is making the bet. It has no idea what the terms of your bet are. And then from the perspective of the blockchain, no one even knows that the transaction that you're making is a discrete log contract contract or a bet on the stock price of Apple. They just see it as a multi-sig transaction the same way that they would see any other multi-sig transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. Obviously, none of this is financial advice, but you could theoretically do the exact same thing with commodities or sports or really any other kind of betting. And if you're like, Rhett, this is great, but I really hate gambling and I think it's stupid. One of the biggest bets that we all engage in, even if we're not hardcore gamblers, is insurance. An auto insurance contract is basically like you saying, hey, Geico, I'm pretty sure I'm going to crash my car, I'm not a very good driver, and I'm worried that I'm about to pay all of this money to fix my car when I inevitably crash it. And then Geico is basically like, no way, dude, you're the safest driver on the planet. There's no way you're gonna crash your car. And then you're like, bro, Geico, like I appreciate what you're saying to me right now, but I'm so sure that I'm gonna crash my car. I'm willing to pay you $100 a month for the next year, but if I crash my car, you have to fix it. Geico does a bunch of math and then they go, all right, bet. And in the case of a discrete log contract, Geico would basically be like, hey man, if you crash your car and the damage is more than three Bitcoins, I'm only gonna pay you three Bitcoins. Is that cool? And then if that was not cool with you, you would be like, hey Geico, make it five Bitcoins and I'll give you 150 bucks a month, yes or yes. Yes or yes. And then Geico would have to do some math and determine if they were willing to underwrite that risk. Hopefully that made sense for you guys and it helped you understand how and why discrete log contracts could be used in the future. The bottom line here is that you can make peer-to-peer -peer bets with anyone in the world 
Your downside is capped at the amount of Bitcoin that you put into the contract. And because it's private and multi-sig transactions look the same on the blockchain, it's going to be very hard to distinguish which transactions are DLCs and which ones are just regular multi-sig transactions. So all of this is pretty private. That's not to say that there won't ever be any issues with discrete log contracts. One of the biggest issues that we didn't really touch on in this video is called the Oracle problem, which if you're interested in learning more about the Oracle problem and how it's been solved or attempted to be solved in cryptocurrencies like Chainlink, definitely leave a comment down below and I'll do my best to answer some of those questions and maybe make an update video if there's enough interest. As far as my opinions, I'm super excited about discrete log contracts going forward. I think any new functionality that's added to the Bitcoin blockchain, it's important that it doesn't create orders of magnitude, more complexity on the base chain so that the blockchain can stay super decentralized because at the end of the day, we can always build extra functionality at higher layers of the blockchain, but we can't replicate how decentralized and secure the Bitcoin blockchain is. I'm also super excited for a lot of the products that are being built on top of discrete log contracts in Bitcoin right now. And I'm gonna be really excited to bring you some really cool app reviews in the future when some of these products finally do come to market. If you guys want to learn more about discrete log contracts, I'll have a couple links down in the description for you guys to check out. The first one is the MIT open course of discrete log contracts. This video is super technical, but it will answer pretty much any question that you have about discrete log contracts. It's what I watched to prepare for this video. And then the second one is an interview with one of my favorite podcasters, Preston Pish, where he's interviewing a discrete log contract developer. And that conversation is a lot less technical and a lot more approachable for someone that's just trying to get a high level understanding of what the implications of discrete log contracts are and what sort of products are being built on top of them that will be released soon here in the future. Comment down below if you have any questions about anything we talked about today. I do still respond to all the comments. And then like the video and subscribe for new videos every Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Also go down in the description and check out the link for the second channel. I will have videos coming up there soon. So definitely subscribe and hit the notification bell if you're interested in when that content is gonna be dropping. That's it for today, guys. I love you all. Goodbye.